and expecting people to patronize you. So you are forced, if you open a restaurant as it is, to work within that framework. But it's it's a bad framework, and it's one that makes many of its employees like burnt out and feel undervalued. Like imagine if so, if you if you've worked in a restaurant, you've seen a scenario where you have five servers on for a night, right? And you come in, and all five servers come in, and the manager looks at them and he says, "Hey," or she says, "Hey." we've only got X, Y, Z reservations, right? So maybe you got childcare to come in tonight. Maybe, I mean, you definitely probably expended some sort of money, whether it was bus fare or gas to get to work. You've been here for a half hour and you're going to go home and you've only clocked in for that half hour, right? So you at 2.13, you will have made a dollar and five cents that you will be taxed for Because that business, what, had a bad night and didn't absorb it for themselves. So they passed it off to you, right? Like, that's crazy (laughs) that that happens. But it happens all of the time in restaurants. And then the responsibility comes to the employees to manage it as opposed to the business figuring out, well, like, why don't we have enough people, right? Or why isn't my schedule? more efficient? Why am I not doing a better job of forecasting so that I don't waste people's time and money? But that sort of thing happens all over the industry. And because we allow them to offset the cost of labor, nobody says anything. And many businesses lean on that and succeed in spite of really poor management. Mm. And do you, you know, being on that side as somebody who did live off of tips do you start to profile people when they walk in a restaurant like start to size up like hmm probably not going to tip that well oh this is probably going to do better than this like do you do you actually start to you know profile people or even stereotype people and then the number one question is is it true what they say about negroes do they tip less than others I stereotype based on behavior, not on type, not on looks, right? Certain behaviors certainly lead to tippers. And I don't think that that is true across the board, right? Like I've had people who were awful pains in the ass, but seemed to realize that they were awful pains in the ass and so tipped really well accordingly, right? Uh, But there are... So let me backtrack. One of the things that I tell people, because not every bad restaurant experience is the restaurant's fault. And this is something that a lot of people don't understand. You have to understand yourself. You have to manage your expectations. It's a lot like getting into a relationship, right? Like how many people break up with somebody and are willing to be like, yeah, like it was me. You know, here's what I did, right? Everybody goes to a restaurant and they're like, man, you know, they f-ed up. It's like, okay. But then you go out with that person and you see their dining habits and you just be like, man, Jesus Christ, bro. Like, like, what do you want these people to do? Like, how many fiery hoops do you need to jump through? Like, you just sent back your second entree because... <laughs> There was an item on the menu and you don't know what it was, but then it came here and you asked what it was and told them you were allergic to it. But like you didn't read it and say anything the first time. Right. Or maybe you didn't understand it because the world of food can be very complicated and fancy. Right. We use all kinds of fancy words to describe simple things. Uh, And so there's a lot of food illiteracy. Right. There's just a lot of people don't understand. And there's a hesitance to ask questions. And then these items show up and they're like, oh, I don't want that. Right. But again, at a restaurant (laughs) now, that business owner, it's expected that they take it back because you don't like it pretty much regardless of the reason, which is another terrible business model. Right. Like if I sell you a book, if I sell you a book and you don't like that book, you bought a book. (laughs) 
Oh, oh my gosh. No, it's a fact. This is a fact. This is a fact. You know, if you open up a bag of popcorn from the store and you don't like that bag, like, well, you just bought a bag of popcorn, but at a restaurant, like, people go in and they do all kinds of crazy stuff. And so when you see those behaviors, you know that those people are going to be bad tippers, right? Because there's a social contract that you enter into when you come into a restaurant. And you understand this if you come up going to restaurants, if you have the opportunities, like you said, to go visit fine dining establishments. Everything doesn't need to be snooty, but there's a social contract for every room that we walk into, right? When you go in a strip club, there's a social contract. When you go into the club club, whatever room you walk into, like, you know, in the black community, we call it the game. And the game is out there and it's play or get played. But when you walk into a restaurant, you have to know yourself. You have to know your tastes. You have to know your allergies. You have to relay those things to the waiter. You have to make a decision based on those things about something that you think you will enjoy. And if the restaurant hits on all of the things that they promise to hit you, then you need to pay for it. If you don't like it, I'm sorry, but you don't get to then sh- on the waiter by tipping them 5% because you're upset that, oh, you know, I didn't realize the salmon was going to be so salmony, which is like, literally, that's that's a right. real quote that I've heard, right? But right. People, people say the most absurd things, and then instead of calling the manager over to complain, they dock the server or the bartender because of things that were really outside of either one of those two people's controls, right? So... Like, no, that is not specific to black people because there are just as many, if not more, non-black tippers than there are. But then we also have to be realistic about the situation for black folks, right? Economics, economics, economics. We don't have, many of us don't have, far too many of us don't have the access to the expendable income that allows us to go out and have dinner at places that are going to cost you $200 after tip, right? And if you're not aware of that social contract and you sit down and you're like, okay, I'm looking at these numbers on the menu, but I'm not factoring in a 28% upcharge, bro. 28%. That's fucking crazy. We're looking at numbers on a menu, right? But the social contract says the 8% being taxed, 20% going to grant. This is what is expected of you. So I can put something onto the menu for $75, but like, really what I'm saying is you got to pay 103. That is garbage. You know what I mean? That's like booking an Airbnb and thinking you got a deal for 200. Yeah, yeah. And next thing you know, it's 150 in cleaning fees. But like, we know that that 28% is there. So just put it on the guy menu and call it a day. Because like, yeah. that's what's fair. And that's what's honest. And a lot of people are not going to like that. And it's going to further like deepen the disparity gap. But like, I I think we need to address that versus continuing to allow people in the industry, because here's what's real. If the black and brown restaurant workers, the bussers, right, the non-bartenders were making what they deserved in restaurants, the disparity gap, the income gap for the black community would get better because the people working in those roles would be paying more money. And they would possibly be able to go out, right? But for right now, we're allowing these people to come to work. And maybe they make $50 for a shift. And then we give them a day off. And, you know, if you made $50 a shift times five days a week, how many jobs do you need to keep your house running? A lot. Yeah, for sure. Like, 